so I've had a word uh, burning inside of me for a while now. And when we heard, you know, six weeks or so ago that Alan was going to Hawaii, I said, hey, I've, I've got a word. If you don't mind, I'd love to preach. And he says, no, that's great. You can do it. What I didn't know at the time was the, uh, the, the last two weeks, Alan has been preaching about a fence, which really perfectly sets up the message today. So if you came knowing that Alan wasn't going to be here and you're like, oh, finally, a break from the offense message, I'm sorry, uh, no break. No break for you, but it's good. I think the Lord might be wanting you to hear it. Um, but I'm going to take a page. At, well, let me, let me say it first. Um, I just know from my own personal experience, and I'm sure you do as well, that when offense takes root in your heart, um, it can compromise your, compromise your heart, and it can take you off a path that God has you on. I'm going to talk about that path today. I'm going to talk about those detours to destiny, detours from destiny. And so I, I really want to go after the fact that offense and angry responses can blind you and even cause you to miss a crucial turn on your journey. You know, back before GPS, we had, we had to follow maps or directions or read signs and things like that. And if you weren't paying attention, even with GPS, I somehow still miss turns Especially up around Española, there's some turns, and I always get, you know, 50 miles later, I'm like, wait a second, this isn't, this isn't where we're supposed to be. So that's the same thing. If you, if you allow your heart to be pulled into that offense and to stay there and not get what you need from the Lord from that, it can be a detour from destiny. I want to talk about that. But first, I want to start out like Bill Johnson does, you know, because me and Bill Johnson, are, we get mentioned in the same breath a lot. Uh, <laughs> With a joke. I think Bill Johnson's next book should be a joke book because his jokes, I think, are really funny. So this is one of his, one of his jokes. Um, the Pope was in the United States doing a tour of, of America. I got a big laugh last night just with that line. <laughs> and my joke-telling self-confidence like went through the roof. Uh, I, I know I have to work a little harder this morning. I've got to earn it. I, I, that's okay. Okay, so the Pope is touring through the states, and uh, his limo driver is taking him through Texas, and they're driving down some real open highways, not a lot of people around. And uh, the Pope taps on the glass, and the driver rolls the glass down, and the Pope says, I would, I've always wanted to drive a car, especially a car like this. They don't let me drive at the Vatican very much, and uh, I wonder if you would indulge me and let me just drive for a little bit. And the driver's like, hey, you're the Pope. You get what you want. So they switch spots, and the Pope is just really loving driving down these wide-open Texas highways, and uh, his foot gets a little heavy. Next thing you know, he's 20 miles over the speed limit, and the state trooper pulls him over. So the state trooper comes up to the window, taps on the glass, license and registration, please, and then he sees who it is, and he says, oh, hold on, I'll be right back. He goes back to his patrol car, picks up his CB, and he says, hey, uh, dispatch, I need to talk to the chief. The chief gets on, and he says, uh, chief, I, I got a situation here. I, I've hooked a big fish, and I don't know how to handle this. I got a big VIP. And the chief's like, oh, would you pull over the mayor or what? No, 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 bigger than the mayor. Did you pull over the governor? Says, Sir, it's bigger than the governor. Are you telling me you just pulled over the president of the United States? Sir, I'm telling you that I don't know who I pulled over, but his limo driver is the Pope. <laughs> yes. Hey. Still got it. All right. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> I'm going to read this passage out of, this is out of Acts, and this is Stephen talking to the people who are about to stone him to death, and he says this, at this time Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight, and he was brought up for three months in his father's house, and when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son, and Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds, and when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. 
And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian. Now, this account is also told slightly differently, but in the, in the book of uh, Exodus chapter 2. And what happened was, this is Moses. You remember his story. He was born in Egypt during a time where the Pharaoh was worried about the population growth among the Hebrews. And he put a, an edict in place where if a male child was given birth in the Hebrew uh, camp, they, they would have to put him to death. They would throw the baby in the, in the Nile River. And Moses' parents were righteous, and they said, we're not going to do that. They hid him, and they, when he was uh, very small, about three months old, they, they put him in a, in a basket, put him in the Nile River. Pharaoh's daughter found him. Uh, Moses' sister was hanging out in the bulrushes, and she said, hey, do you want me to find a nurse, a Hebrew woman, to nurse the baby? Really clever. And so Moses' mother received the baby back and was able to, to nurse Moses until he was old enough to go live with Pharaoh's daughter. So Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's court and his family became Moses' family, and he was raised in, in, the, uh, in the court of Egypt. But we see that, obviously, he knows, as you see in this passage, that the, the Hebrews are his people. And we see that as he is uh, seeing the oppression of his people. He comes across uh, one of his own being beaten by a, an Egyptian, he sees the injustice and it stirs him to action. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with seeing injustice and being stirred to action. But as I'm going to talk about here today, it matters how you respond. It matters the action that you take. Okay, And the wrong action can put you on a detour. So when Moses, instead of uh, seeking the, the strength and the wisdom of the Lord, he, he took this matter with his own strength and with the wisdom that he got from Egypt. And that wisdom is might is right. That wisdom is beat the people that uh, you need to submit to you into submission. And uh, that's the way of the world. That's what, we, that's what we're living with right now. So he relied and acted on the wisdom of the world, not God's wisdom. And this detour ended up costing him 40 years. I think he recognized there was going to be deliverance because God even said to Abraham hundreds of years before, you, your people will be in captivity for 400 years, but I will deliver them. So God called dibs on deliverance way back when. It was God that was going to do it, not Moses. And God used Moses to do that, but that came 40 years later when he um, met God at the burning bush and received his call. So I want to tell you a story this morning about this woman. And I want to tell you that... Um, there are some heavy parts to it, uh, but it's really my heart's desire that this is a story that lifts you and not, not um, puts you in a heavy place. Like I said, heavy moments in it, but there is a story of redemption in this because, because of Jesus, because Jesus is present in this story. My mom passed away three years ago in March, and um, I understand that there are some things I know about her story from my own experience and from other people's accounts, but I, I, I understand that no one knows someone's story like that person themselves. You don't know my story like I know my story. But here's another thing. We don't know our story like God knows our story, right? And so the things that I saw, the things that I observed, the things that I deduced, it doesn't mean I got it right, uh, but, but I think there's some lessons here to be, to be learned. I had, I just got to tell you, I had a golden childhood. I'm one of those people who, um, who people who've had a hard time in, in their childhood, there's some, you know, they look at me like, wow, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Not really, but I just had this beautiful upbringing. I, I was raised in a, in a family that loved Jesus. Jesus was the difference. And we, we, were, we were kind of a lower middle class family. We lived in a I lived in a mobile home for, I don't know, most of my childhood until I was in my teen years. We didn't have a lot of money, but, man, we had, we had Jesus. There's a joy in our house. Uh, my dad was a pastor. My mom was uh, just a radiant person. I'm going to read some things I wrote down uh, of my memories and recollections of her. 
that I wrote for the eulogy I gave at her funeral three years ago. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> My earliest memories of mom are lovely. A vibrant, jubilant, beautiful, loving, compassionate, generous, joyful, musical force of nature who brightened rooms and made people feel infinitely valued with a word, a smile, or a loving touch. A person whose words did not go unheard or unheeded, but went straight to the heart of those to whom she spoke. I'm not trying to deify her, and I know she was not perfect, but when I, as a young man, compared her to the, all the other mothers I could see, no one even came close. I remember her love for music. To this day, when I hear Stevie Wonder, the Imperials, or the Doobie Brothers... Any fans in the room? Come on. Yeah. I can, I, can hear, I can see her dancing in the kitchen or her fingers playing piano chords on the car dashboard, which is something a tradition I carry on to this day. I can hear her powerful, beautiful voice bringing people to tears in church pews when she stood on stage and sang for the congregation. It came from one of those churches where people would do special music every once in a while. She was the first person I knew who wrote songs. She taught me my first guitar chords and showed me how to sing. She looked out for me to the end, even coming to my concerts and telling the sound guy how to do his job. Sorry, Sean, if you were one of those guys. I remember her rooting for the underdog. More than once, she scolded us kids when we tease or make fun of someone behind their backs. Mom would say, I bet their mothers love them. Man, those words stick... To, with me to this day, and I, I, I keep playing that through. When someone's getting on my nerves, I say, I bet their mother loves them. She stood up to tyrants, whether it was by throwing her coffee mug and screaming at stray dogs that were chasing a kitten, true story, or by opposing bullies who messed with her kids. I remember her doing everything she could for us. I recall my sister Delina asking for money to go to an after-school dance and mom giving the few remaining dollar bills she had in her wallet. When she saw in my face that I wished I could go to the dance as well, without a second thought, she started digging through sofa cushions, car ashtrays, you guys remember those, <laughs> and junk drawers until she triumphantly held up a Ziploc bag full of dusty coins that bought my ticket. I was so grateful for a gesture of love that I wasn't even embarrassed plunking down that heavy bag on the admission table to the cheerleaders that were selling tickets. I remember mom's concern for me when I enlisted in the Air Force. She was worried that, in her words, my gentle spirit would be corrupted. I figured she was worried that I would start drinking, smoking, and cussing. She need not have worried as I made it through four years in the military with my piety intact. I did not start drinking, smoking, or cussing until I joined the ministry. I'm just kidding. I don't smoke or drink. <laughs> I remember her encouragement to me when I thought <laughs> that I'd never find someone to love. She told me she'd been praying for my wife since I was a boy. And she just knew I would find her and that this woman would exceed my hopes and dreams. Thank you for praying, Mama. God heard you loud and clear. So... When I was about eight or nine years old, my mom was hospitalized and um, her, her gallbladder erupted, ruptured. I keep getting that word wrong, whatever it is. Erupted is what's happening in, in Hawaii, but her, her gallbladder ruptured and she got septic. You know, she had an infection in her blood and she got very sick and she was in grave danger for several days. Um, she was hospitalized for about three weeks, and I remember that uh, my sister and brother and I went out to uh, our, our grandparents' farm in Dublin, Texas, and we just spent, spent those three weeks out there during that summer. And, uh, and we were kind of sheltered from the news. We didn't realize how dire the situation was, but, but she rallied. They got the infection under control, and, and, uh, and she made a recovery. But while she was in that situation... Uh, the doctors were giving her Demerol for pain management. And if you don't know, that's a, that's a narcotic, and, um, and it's very habit-forming. And she was able to cut off her usage of that once she recovered. But uh, as I talked with my dad, 
And, and looking back in, in retrospect, it seems like that's where she got the taste for, uh, for narcotics, for prescription medication. And um, as, uh, as the years went on up into my, uh, my high school years and my first, first few years in the Air Force, um, she started to complain of different pains. She, she was complaining of migraine headaches. Um, she had read somewhere about lupus and, and went to several different doctors to, to say she thought she had lupus. And my dad says four different doctors, she saw four different doctors and all four of them said, no, you don't, you don't have lupus. Um, but yet she complained of these, this pain in her head and, and, and got access to, to more Demerol. There's a period of, of time uh, when I was in the Air Force where my parents separated and part of that was my dad drawing the line and saying, no, you don't need this. You don't have this issue. I'm, I don't want you to have access to this medication. And so she went and lived with her parents for a while. And uh, um, after several months, they basically put an ultimatum before her. You need to get cleaned up. You're not living with us anymore if you're going to continue on this path. So she went back to my dad. They reconciled. Uh, things seemed to rally for a little while. We got out of the Air Force. We moved out here to Albuquerque uh, back in uh, 94, and I started going to UNM. And my mom was still dealing with some things and, and using some, uh, some prescription drugs from time to time. And, um, and one time she, uh, just through different things that she was dealing with, she decided to overdose on, on the pills. And I remember my dad was at work. I was at home. I was waiting for a buddy of mine to come over. We're going to hang out and play guitar and just visit. And, uh, and my mom came in before he showed up, and she said, I don't want you to be embarrassed or ashamed of me. And it was just out of left field. And, and I'd been used to this, this change in my mom from, from this vibrant, beautiful, free, loving you know, woman to starting to deal with more emotional manipulation in her language, um, guilt trips, hooks in her words, things like that. And I saw her, who she was, slowly start to disappear and, and be replaced with um, less than who she was, be replaced with someone who um, was kind of embracing a, a victim mentality and a brokenness mentality. And, um, and I try to have compassion, but it, it was really hard for me to do that. It was really hard for me to see her uh, giving into this, this pain and just self-medicating and numbing the pain through all these things. So when she said, uh, I don't want you to be ashamed of me or embarrassed of me, it felt like one of those things again where she was trying to, you know, get some kind of a response out of me and get me to affirm her and tell her, no, you're not, you're not, I'm not ashamed of you. But I really wasn't. I wasn't ashamed of her. But I, I recognized after the fact that she had just taken those, those pills and she was waiting for the, the thing to, to kick in, the, for the overdose to, to kick in uh, shortly Shortly after, 20, 30 minutes later, um, there are paramedics at the door. Uh, she called the paramedics and told them that she she tried to overdose. So they take her, they took her to the to the uh, ER and and pumped her stomach and all that. And my dad came and he said to her on the way back home after she was released, "I cannot bear the thought of coming home and finding you dead on the floor." So you, you have to change. Here are your options. You can go see a therapist, and we can get you wind off this stuff. Or I'm going to check you into a detox center where they're going to get you clean. What do you want to do? And she opted to go see a therapist. So my dad asked his primary care physician um, for a recommendation on a Christian counselor. And the guy says, I actually don't know any Christian counselors I can refer, but I can look up some names. And he found him a name of a man that was that uh, was listed as a Christian therapist, and so uh, my mom started seeing this man um, in counseling and therapy for uh, a number of years, a couple of years at least. I don't remember the, the the timeline exactly on that, but I remember in the midst of that therapy, one time I had a conversation with my sister, and uh, my mom had told her of some things that had been had surfaced in therapy as she was talking with this doctor. And, um, and there were hard things, and I'm not going to defile you with the details, but they were allegations, really horrific allegations against someone in the family um, that uh, the doctor said my mom had repressed these memories. And uh, my 
my aunt told me at the funeral, she said, I remember having a conversation with your mother about that. And she asked me, she called and asked me, do you remember anything like this happening? And I said, no, I don't remember that at all. And my mom said, yeah, I don't remember it either, but the doctor thinks I'm repressing that memory. And uh, she had no recollection of it. I don't know where that, the genesis of that, uh, that thought came about or that allegation came about, but it caused a whole lot of harm. It caused a whole lot of damage um, and, and really hurt the family for a period of time. And so there's a, to, in my estimation, there's a false narrative being fabricated that was destructive and deadly. And, um, and you know, as, as I'll, I'll tell you in a second, it, get, it got worse, but um, it felt like my mom was buying into a story. She had some hurt, she had some offense, and all of a sudden there's some fuel that's being thrown on the fire, and, and it felt like affirmation to her. Now, you can go read the book of Job, and you can read the responses of Job's friends. And some of those guys were telling him things to make him feel better, but it was not godly counsel. And we have to listen to the Holy Spirit. There are people that are going to come to us and try and encourage us and try and help us. And their, their hearts are good and their intentions are good. Uh, but if it's not the counsel of the Lord, we've got to be discerning and be able to, to reject that, push that away. Uh, fast forward to uh, the um, January of 1997, and I was on a college trip. We went to Austin for the first Passion Conference, and I called home after being up there for several days, and I asked my dad how things were going, and he says, well, it's not good, son. Uh, I came home from work the other day, and half the stuff in the house was gone, and there's a note on the coffee table from your mom saying, I can't do this anymore. I'm gone. And only a few weeks later did we come to find out that uh, my mom left my dad and was planning on marrying her doctor, which they did um, as soon as the divorce was final. So three or four months later, she's married to her Christian therapist. I, I feel like I need to say, in case you have any doubts, that's not okay. That's wrong. That is not okay. Um, I think in his mind and, and what I've heard him say, and what I heard my mom say that he said, look, the man that you're married to doesn't love you because he's not giving you what you need. I can give you what you need. And that was obviously a horrible and horrific example of codependency. She needed access to the narcotics or she thought she did and he needed someone to be the hero for and i don't know what his other motives were there's some there's some other theories that are that i won't defile you with but um so they left and for 20 years the last 20 years of my mom's life she was married to this man she had unrestricted access to demerol and to some other narcotics i remember one time i was visiting them and i went looking through the medicine cabinet and there were big bottles, 100 count bottles uh, from four or five different pharmacies, four or five different doctors prescribing these things. Uh, interject that again. That's wrong too. That's not okay. That's uh, exploiting that loophole. And I remember confronting them about it and the doctor saying, well, you know, sometimes uh, the bureaucracy and the red tape and all that kind of stuff is just too, too hard to, to untangle. And it keeps people who need the medication from getting the medication. So I'm just making sure we don't have to, to, to mess with that. So he, he justified exploiting the, uh, the law and going and finding these loopholes. But again, um, this was a destructive path. And so I remember talking to Alan about it because I was ready to go scorched earth confrontation with this, with this doctor and my mother as well. I know that he did not kidnap her. And he was not feeding her these, these drugs against her will. She went along with it completely. She made a choice about that. So she was complicit in her own, in her own destruction. But um, I talked to Alan about it, and I said, you know, he could see the anger. He could see the hatred that was in my heart. And he said to me, Don't lose who you are in dealing with this situation. 
Don't let it compromise the heart that God has given you. And I thank God for those words. I thank God for that counsel. I thank God for Alan. I think it's interesting that the scenario of, the, the, of Moses coming to the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrews the next day after killing the Egyptian, and they were fighting. And we didn't have a scenario of Moses defending the good guys against the bad guys. We had bad guys against bad guys, right? We had fallen people against fallen people. There's nobody that was above reproach in this situation. And, and like I said, I understand that my mom made some choices with that. But sometimes we attack the lack of virtue in our enemies while we overlook or we defend the lack of virtue in our own friends or the people that we love. And that's not healthy. And, and with, the, with the strength of the Lord and the discernment of the Holy Spirit, we can look and see the situation for what it is. We can have spiritual discernment. We can speak out when we need to speak out. And there does, <laughs> there does need to be moments of confrontation. I understand that, and I fully agree with that. There has to be moments of confrontation at times. But how you confront, how you respond, how your heart is when you're doing this is crucial to the fruit that will come from it. It's crucial to your own journey. I'm telling you that anger, that anger felt good. Anybody ever experienced that, the anger that feels good? Because it feels powerful, right? It feels powerful. There's something about anger, a couple of things. It, it releases some reward chemicals in your brain, and it makes you feel like, you know, you're invincible. It also is a, a, a protective measure because it masks deeper emotions that you don't want to feel. It masks some weakness or some fear or some vulnerability or some shame or some guilt or any number of things. And so when we feel that anger, it makes us feel strong again and powerful again. And here's the problem unbridled anger leads to merciless power merciless power that's of the devil that's the power the world deals in we see this power in movies and tv and social media and in culture we see it in violent protests we see it in politics this is the power that returns evil for evil this is the power that has winners and losers successes and failures and in the middle of all this we see jesus we see Jesus, whose greatest success looked to the world like a massive failure. We see Jesus, who lost until he won. And he's our model. He's our example. He's the one that we follow in this. Your attempt to be powerful in your own strength will leave you powerless, ultimately. And it perpetuates that cycle of destruction. You remember that when Moses killed the Egyptian, then Pharaoh wanted to kill him. And so that, that cycle just keeps on going. All right, let's get some good news up in here, shall we? The Lord is gracious and merciful. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Some of us can understand God being gracious and merciful to us. We don't get it for him being that way to other people, right? And then there's some of us who understand God being gracious and merciful to others, but don't understand how he can do that with us. Let's have a Selah moment. Pause. Meditate and reflect on this. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. What happens when you wait on the Lord? What happens when you trust him? What happens when you defer to him? What happens when you say, not my way, but your way, Lord. Not my will, but your will be done. When Pharaoh drew near, this is at the Red Sea, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. What we see in this passage is 
God showing his grace and mercy even to the Egyptians for 10 plagues, 10 opportunities for repentance, right? 10 chances for Pharaoh to soften his heart and to repent and, and 10 stubborn refusals. And finally, when he came after them, God wiped them out. God settled it, and they never had to deal with that again. Now, obviously, <laughs> my message today is not hang in there because one day the Lord will smite your enemy for you. Uh, his heart is to be gracious and compassionate to all. But I'm telling you this, if, you, if, if your enemy the person who's opposing you, the person who's hurting you, the person who's coming against you, stays in the place that they are, they're going to have their own misery just from being there. You guys understand that? You you know that from your own story. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Now listen to these words from Jesus. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard, that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now, I think this is a, a lot of times I heard this just simply being a, a, a verse on salvation and about your eternal destination, right? This verse, though, has deeper meaning than that. It applies to how you live right now. It applies to the quality of your life right now. The, the way that leads to destruction is easy. That's the way of letting anger take over. That's easy to do. Am I right? That's the way of letting offense take root and compromise your heart. That's the way of returning evil for evil, returning insult for insult, returning hurt for hurt, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But the way that leads to life is a narrow way. And this is a reference uh, Jesus was making to a gate uh, in the city walls uh, of Jerusalem. And it was was, uh, a traveler's gate. It wasn't large enough for your animals to, to pass through, you know, with carrying all their heavy, heavy burden and, and baggage and all that kind of stuff. It was for a traveler to go through. And I, I like this picture because uh, we've, we've heard the, uh, the analogy of the heavy things that you carry, the hurt and the offense and all that kind of stuff that weighs you down as being baggage. And imagine you have all this, this, this baggage and you're trying to get through that gate and all of a sudden you can't, you can't make it through because... It's not wide enough for the baggage to come through with you. But if you can lay that down, if you can lay down the hurt, if you can lay down the, the offense, if you can forgive, you can pass through that narrow gate and you can find the path that leads to life. We're constantly on a path. We're constantly on a path. And we come into these intersections when we have offense or when we have hurt or we have wounding. And we have to make a choice every time. I'm going to stay on the path to life or nope, I'm going to go mow this person down or I'm going to harbor hate or whatever response that we have. And it's a heavy thing. But constantly the Lord is telling us and encouraging us and giving us the strength to stay on the path to life. I couldn't forgive my my mom's husband in my own strength. I couldn't do it. I couldn't overcome that anger and that hatred in my heart without the power of the Holy Spirit. But remembering the mercy and the grace and the compassion of of our Father, I was able to let that stuff go. I was able to lay that down. Praise God, I was able to lay that down. Now, um, just briefly, I want to tell you that in in a recent season of my life, I've, I've had a detour again. And... The crazy thing about this detour is I was sure I was right. (laughs) From my limited perspective, and let me say again, God is the only one with the unlimited perspective. From my limited perspective, I felt like I had the, the high ground, the moral authority. And what happened was I allowed my heart to get fouled up with this righteous indignation. And, um, and I remember drawing a line and trying to force the issue and, and, and interacting with people and saying, let's, you know, I'm not going to let this go unchallenged. Again, I want to say, like with Moses, if there's something that's actual legitimate oppression or injustice, we are called to stand against it. But again, 
how you stand matters. And you can't look at the person that you feel is, is the offender and think that their annihilation is the, is the answer because that's not, that's not the solution. And I remember in this, in this season, really calling out, on the, calling out to the Lord and saying, Lord, I, I, I think I'm right, but tell me if I've missed it. Tell me if I've got this wrong. And he answered me with a dream. Uh, I don't dream a whole lot. I mean, I do dream, but they're really random about bulls chasing me and then tickling me. And, you know, <laughs> if there's an interpretation for that, please email me. But <laughs> uh, I, remember, I remember this dream that I woke up and it was so profound. And I had a heaviness because the Lord showed some darkness in my heart through this dream. And he showed how I've been hurting people through this dream. And I won't tell you this, the, the details. You don't need to know those. But I know that in the dream, I was angry and I was defiant and I was invincible. I had this strength that was destroying people in this dream. And I remember this, this really tall, strong man that I'd never seen before was trying to come against me and his attacks were worthless. I repelled them with ease. Um, I was like a superhero. I was just, you know, I was hurting this guy every way I could. And I remember flinging him across the, the yard and he landed on the grass. And as soon as he landed on the grass, he, he turned from a six foot five hulking mass of muscles to a rag doll about this big with my mother's face on it. I told my friend Josh, our friend Josh Garner about it. And uh, Josh does dream interpretations. And I said, what do you think? And I told him the details. And he prayed about it. And he said, this is Moses killing the Egyptian. That's where this message came from. Because I embraced that merciless power. And I didn't make the situation any better. In fact, I made it worse. And I realized when I awakened from the dream, what I needed to do was clean my mess up. What I needed to do was repent. I needed to ask forgiveness from the people that I hurt. I needed to make sure my mess was cleaned up. And so I started what I dubbed my apology tour, <laughs> my seeking forgiveness to her. And the people that I, uh, I spoke to were, of course, gracious and uh, willing to forgive. And I thank the Lord for that. I just want to say that the path of destruction, the, it's not just about, like I said, it's not just about annihilation. When you look up the, the words and study it in, in depth, it talks about a road of perdition or a wretched road of a wasted life. Like you keep walking on that, on that road. And I saw my mom on that road for 20 years, hanging on to the fact that she hadn't been heard the way that she wanted to be heard, hanging on to the fact that people didn't acknowledge the pain that she was in, believing the lies that people didn't love her, that her, her children didn't love her, her husband, her ex-husband didn't love her, her parents, her siblings didn't love her. And only this, this man was the one who loved her because he gave her what she wanted. She held on to that, and I just saw the, the, the hollow life that she lived. And the Lord gave me grace, and my wife, Grace, she, my wife was like really the one who took charge and said, hey, let's reach out to your mom. There's a period of time where she was living in town, and, and um, Becky really wanted us to go over every week and have a meal with them, and I thought that was beautiful. I didn't want to do it, <laughs> but I thought it was beautiful. And, uh, and he gave me grace for that, but I could see it. I could hear it in her conversation. And towards the end of her life, I want to say two things um, about it. One thing was um, I got to see her. The last time I got to see her was a month before she died. And I was in Texas. She was living down close to Austin. I was in Texas with Alan. We'd, we'd gone to a Jack Taylor uh, meeting. And, and 
Mama Gail had this amazing idea, and I'm so grateful for, for her. I think it was the Lord. And, he, and she said, why don't you drive down and see your mom and then come back later? When the, when the time of Jack Taylor's over, drive down and see your mom. And so I did. And I took a guitar, and I got to sit there on her bed in the, in the hospice, uh, assisted, assisted uh, living place. And um, I sang her some songs, and she, she loved it. She was requesting all these different songs. And I uh, got to sit there and sing these songs to her. I bought her, uh, my sister and I bought her Sonic, which is one of her favorite meals. Supersonic cheeseburger with mayo and a cherry limeade and some tater tots. And uh, we had a communion with that. And, uh, and it was just an amazing time. It was just, it was an amazing time because she didn't have those hooks in her words. It was just light and free. And it was a burden off my shoulders. And one night when she passed a month later, I just thanked the Lord for that last time to spend with my mom. That it was so pure. That's so beautiful. She wrote my brother a letter. And my brother had the hardest time out of the three kids with my mom. Because in the midst of her really heavy drug use, he was around. And she was just stoned out of her mind, unable to function. And he was the parent. Here's a 16-year-old boy being the parent in the situation. Taking care of my mom. Getting her in bed at night. Doing things that a son shouldn't have to do, you know, finding, you know, fixing meals for himself and, and all these things. And he said, uh, Hey, mom sent me a letter. This is about five months before she died. I'm like, yeah, what was that about? And he says, well, it's just everything I wanted to hear for 20 years. And I'm like, that's awesome. And I just kind of, I didn't pry because it was, seemed like a personal thing. But five months later, I talked to him and I said, hey, I'm sitting here trying to prepare the eulogy and I'm, I'm stuck. I don't really know how to do this. I'm going to be talking to her family. And these are all people that were really hurt by, by her and, and felt the isolation and saw her disappear for 20 years. And um, I, I wonder if you'd share your letter with me. It's, if it's too personal, that's fine. He's like, no, I, I, want you to, I want you to have it. I want you to see it. And if you want to share it at the funeral, you can. And so uh, I want to read this to you. Um, because here's the thing, you can be on that path of destruction and you can be the offender, but you can also be the offended and still be on that same path. Do you hear me? You can be the offender who's caused a whole bunch of hurt and pain and you feel I'm too far gone. I can't fix that mess. I've hurt too many people. Or you can be the offended, the one who's been hurt, the one who's been wronged, and you can also be on that same path, that same wasted life path, perdition, because you can't let that go. And your, your ability to enjoy the abundant life has been compromised by bitterness and by offense. My mom writes, my dearest Clark, I come to you today with a very burdened heart. I've loved you from the first time you moved in my belly. When they handed you to me, I looked at your beautiful face and my heart soared. I knew God had given me a special gift. You grew strong and were always crawling, walking, or running. You were smart, caught on to everything so fast, and you never forgot anything. You constantly amazed me with your thoughts, but you also had me wrapped around your little finger with your dimpled smile, your charm, and your sharp wit. You did with everyone. People were drawn to you because you were the whole package. You told me one day that you'd figured it out. You said God had given Delina the gift of playing the piano and singing. God had given Chuck the gift of music and song. But for you, God had given you the gift of strength and of speed and of athletics. You were not a failure. You simply were blessed with a strong mind, body, and spirit. You are special. and There is no shame in that. You have the gift of learning quickly and doing anything you put your mind to. I thank God for you every day. Sweetheart, I started this letter by saying my heart was burdened, not for anything you did or didn't do, but for the many times I failed you. I wasn't there for you when I should have been. I was selfish, self-centered, and you paid the price. Can you search your heart, mind, and soul and forgive me? I know my behavior was wrong. I neglected you and didn't stand as your mother, 
a loving caregiver, protector, and friend. And again, I ask your forgiveness. I've missed you so much. I can't tell you how thrilled I am that you and Mindy found each other again. Mindy is so precious and she loves you. God was with both of you all the way back in high school, and now she's blessed you with two beautiful children. Kylie is such a wonderful and special child, and I know that you recognize this in our loving and caring father. Then there is young Jackson. What a beautiful blessing God gave you and Mindy. I watched you at Jonah's graduation, and I saw the joy in your face as you bounced him on your lap. Son, I pray that each day that you look at your beautiful wife and children and feel the joy and love for each of them. And that makes your heart leap for what you have overcome. I love you, Clark, more than you can imagine. As only a parent can love their baby, I love you always and forever, Mom. <laughs> so, my brother had that letter, hand, it was handwritten, and so his wife typed it up and emailed it to me. I was home by myself preparing and when I read that letter I wailed <laughs> for 20 minutes and it, was a, it was a good thing it was a healing thing and I felt 20 years of pain and tension and offense and regret and remorse just disappear just drain away by the grace of God and by this beautiful expression of repentance no hooks, no barbs, no emotional manipulation, no guilt trips, just a pure expression of my mom saying, doing what moms are supposed to do, right? Affirming, speaking life over her son, telling him how great he was. You know, moms are presidents of our fan clubs, right? They believe in you. Mom and God are the only one who believes in you for everything. And so the healing that came from that and from seeing that my mom, even after a 20-year detour, turned around and repented, got to a place where her heart wasn't heavy anymore. And I remember my sister even said, she talked to her on the phone, and, and my mom said, you think your, your father would be up for me calling him because I, I need to make some things right with him. And my sister says, of course. And she, she didn't make it to that she didn't get to do that before she passed but it was in her heart to do so and I, I feel like the repentance when it happens I'm telling you this just like that the grace of God floods in the healing power of God floods in you could be 500 miles from home and you turn around and as soon as you turn around that's the grace of God right there right there with you right there on you now the process of, of fixing your mess, of cleaning up the stuff that you've done and, and trying to address the hurts that you may have caused, that takes time. But with the help of the Lord, with his wisdom, with his strategy, with the power of his Holy Spirit, he'll get you through it. He'll see you through it. So I want you to stand today because I feel like today there's hope for both the offender and the offended. It's not too late to turn around. It's not too late to restore relationships. It's not too late to get back on that path that God had you on. So I'm going to ask the ministry team to come up. If you feel like uh, you want to pray this morning. And I just want to appeal to you guys. Like it says in Hebrews, today if you hear the voice of the Lord, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. I assure you it's not too late. I praise God that when I had taken a, a, a few steps down that path of destruction, when I was on that detour, that really quickly he, he got my attention. And he gave me a warning. He gave me a rebuke. That dream was a rebuke. And I was so grateful. And I was overwhelmed that the creator, God Almighty, Lord of heaven and earth, would speak to me in a dream and say, Son, this is not your path. This is not the path that leads to life. So today is not too late to turn around. 
it's not too, too late to receive that grace of God in your life. Whether you are offended or whether you were the offender, the Lord has your, has your healing waiting for you right now. Come and receive prayer if, if that speaks to you. I just want to say again, um, I don't want you to walk out of here burdened. I want you to be uplifted. I want you to have hope in your heart and know the courage of the Lord. We need a, a, a female over here. Um, I want you to feel the hope that you can that you can call out to the Lord and receive what you need. The Lord will give you what you need. He will give you the wisdom. If anyone lacks wisdom, ask for it. He will give it to you. He will show you how to walk these things out. He will show you how to keep boundaries in place when you need to keep boundaries in place. That's okay. Absolutely. That's essential. But he will show you how to walk with an unburdened heart. He will show you how to get through that narrow gate onto the path of life. still stands. Great is his faithfulness. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name, Jesus. so I can follow up with you. Um, so stop by and say hi to him. We are overcomers, aren't we? We are more than conquerors. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness in our lives. We receive your blessing. We receive your power. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. Fill us again. Refresh us again. Revive us again, Lord. May we walk strongly in your love, in your grace, in your mercy, in your forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Thank you guys. You're dismissed.